lesson learned today, if nothing else, never send a voice message. Well, the other lesson learned, I've ne bizarrely, I've never had a smartphone. Never had a smartphone in my life. And one of the reasons was uh, I'm, I'm, off, I'm online far too much anyway, and I thought I need some headspace. And I'm glad now I, I've never been on it. I don't, I've never had a WhatsApp, and, it, and I'm sure Stephen Ward has now deleted it from his phone, if he's any sense. I'm sure his phone's been crushed and <laughs> thrown out the window uh, at this stage. Uh, for those who may have been asleep for the majority of today, um, the basic premise of this is, obviously we know that Martin O'Neill and Roy Keane uh, basically outlined a series of arguments that happened in the Irish camp last summer, the summer just gone, that involved John Walters and Harry Arter. Harry Arter clearly has said that he doesn't want to be involved in the Irish setup for the time being. He's absent from the squad that has uh, gathered for these games uh, in the Nations League with Wales just gone and on tomorrow night actually uh, with Poland. Um, he was staying quiet on his reasons for staying out of the camp and this morning audio began circulating different WhatsApp groups that weren't Stephen Ward's uh, of a message purportedly from the Burnley fullback that was outlining in great detail and with uh, several uses of industrial language what had gone on in the Ireland camp that resulted in these rows between John Walters and Roy Keane and John Walters and Harry Arter and uh, sometimes in a combination of the three as well. This afternoon, there were a lot of tense conversations in this office about how close we could sail mm. uh, towards mentioning this because ultimately the name wasn't out there. We'd no guarantee that this actually was Stephen Ward. Uh, we'd no guarantee that this actually was the correct version of events. Thankfully, Martin O'Neill did a lot of the legwork for us this evening. First of all, I don't think Stephen was there. Stephen wasn't actually there, so I think he's just uh, picking up on things, something that we talked about at the beginning of the week. Probably not anything more to really report. I think um, I think that um, uh, differences of what was said. Um, I think I mentioned that to you before. Um, d definitely, um, uh, as I said, to uh, confrontation, obviously, with John and uh, confrontation with um, with Harry. John's fine, absolutely fine. Harry, perhaps not so fine. Uh, congratulations to the Irish journalists on the ground in uh, Rocklov who have now become minor celebrities in the area because they've <laughs> been asked to appear on camera and appear on, by microphones uh, to give a sense of what's gone on here. It, and how would you explain? Imagine being an Irish journalist over there and being asked to explain I, Roy Keane. This, how could you explain Roy Keane? Where do you start? Like you're looking at like a Tolkien depth book mm. as regards trying to go into the... like The backstory of this just goes back donkey's years in yeah. trying to explain the enigma wrapped in a vest, wrapped in a shaved head, that is Roy Keane. Yeah. It's... <laughs> I know, but I think the scales have fallen from a lot of people's eyes in that his brilliance as a footballer kind of uh, let us forgive a lot of the uh, extreme aspects of his personality. That happens with anybody, though. Yeah. That happens, like, the list of musicians whose... Of course, yeah. ...whose shady pasts are, well, a lot of his been brought into account, who were forgiven because, oh Christ, they wrote that album or yeah, you know, yeah. they wrote that, sang that song. It's the same with sports people. We kind of forgive a lot of their, and Serena Williams is a case in point yeah. uh, this weekend, I guess, as well. We forgive a lot of their ills because of what they offer in terms of their day job. Yeah. And Roy Keane was no different. Now, sadly, what Keane offers in terms of his day job is becoming less tangible. Yeah, it's very, very fascist. vague. It's very, very vague. And like, even if you go by his last book, you know, he effectively said he was sulking for the last couple of months, or last while at Ipswich, and that, um, you know, he wasn't going into training for days and end, and he would turn up in match day and stuff, and you go, this is the manager, and he's saying that to himself. If you were a prospective club uh, owner or chairman looking to apply somebody, and you read that, you think, why would you give him a gig? And, you know, you go back to how he left Manchester United, that Alex Ferguson, the greatest manager of all, ultimately found him unmanageable. You know, the way he shot his mouth off at that MUTV thing. He can't help, what, he doesn't seem to be able to govern his tongue. Mm. Like what he says. Even the like, fact that he's had two autobiographies out. Yeah, yeah. Not, is he 50 yet? He's not. Yeah. Well, he's, he's full of contradictions. He always has been. Like this is a guy who has railed against celebrity culture for years, but who actually met the producers of I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here, and considered going into the jungle to eat crocodile testicles. So... 
Amongst other things. To be Amongst fair. other things, there were other things he could have eaten: witchetty grubs, etc. Yeah, it's it's a bizarre situation. Uh, Dan McDonnell, the Irish Independent, is on the uh, is on the ground over in Poland. Uh, Dan, you're at this press conference. I'd imagine you're a minor celebrity now in that area. Poland uh, have been asked to explain all that's going on uh, with the Keen and the Harry Arger and John Walters, and now Stephen Ward's situation. Oh, listen, I just got the hell out of there. I didn't want to be explaining that to anybody, Richie. Like, I, 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 uh, I, I did have a look around towards the end because, uh, I mean, and, and Kieran would obviously know this, it sort of split. There was a, a daily section afterwards as well and there would be more coming out sort of, I suppose, overnight mm. and tomorrow morning in the various papers. But it was in that section because naturally, I suppose, in that section, the questions don't need to be as polished maybe as such. So there's yeah. a bit more yeah. detail being thrashed out. And, you know, I looked around and the Polish, they didn't have a clue what was going on. They were just sort of looking completely perplexed and, and puzzled by the whole thing. So, yeah, I mean, I, you know, it just goes to show, is there ever, is there ever really anything uh, as, a, as a meeting that's international friendly? You know, with, with the Irish team, there, there can always be a story that pops up when you maybe least expect it. And certainly, you know, I think most people... I don't know, a lot of people in Ireland of a certain age have got that WhatsApp audio by, uh, by lunchtime today. Mm. And uh, I, I guess it was no different around the Irish camp, the Irish team hotel. Uh, and, and we knew that we were on to a day that was, that was a bit... It wasn't going to be a pre-match press conference about someone's hamstring. Yeah. Like that. Um, we heard a little bit of Martin O'Neill there. We'll play more of it in depth later on in the show. But that clip in particular, and it struck me while watching it as well, is that he was struggling for the right words to say around this situation. And again, he was just kind of uttering half sentences of stuff that we'd already heard in a way that tried to bat this away and, and put it to bed rather quickly. But the idea that we have, um, and I know Stephen Ward is probably going through the ringer uh, this evening and today, we have the idea that we have a member of the Ireland team who's outlining the issues that some members would have uh, with Roy Keane, at least offering their version of events uh, to their mates, it doesn't strike a great note of harmony within the Irish camp. What kind of tone did O'Neill have uh, with ye afterwards without wanting to give away the content of what you're going to be printing tomorrow? Yeah, it's strange. I mean, I have to say that, you know, I, I, I felt early on when it was discussed and it was raised, it was a bit awkward. But actually, as it went on, he sort of relaxed into it a bit more. And I, I, I'm not sure if I'd say, go as far to say, handle it quite well. But I don't think he sort of poured fuel onto the sort of flames either in terms of his general demeanour. I mean, we were obviously batting about all day and we had got word as the press conference approached that they were going to address it because naturally that, that, that sort of, I, I don't know, was concerned, but, you know, it lingered. They, they could come out and deny it and then you get into a sort of a very bizarre uh, limbo with this clip that everyone had listened to. But they sort of come out and addressed it head on and... and uh, you know, they didn't deny, I suppose, didn't deny that, that, that it came from somewhere in their camp while also stressing that, that Roy Keane has a different version of events. But I, I suppose as much as is possible, he's, he's got out there and he's, he's had his say. But I, I think this goes back to last week, really, uh, where at this stage, I think Martin O'Neill has aligned himself very much with Roy Keane. So it's very hard for him to distance themselves from them at any mm. stage. They are very much a duo. They're, they're five years down the road. They're almost five years down the road. He, he publicly supported Roy Keane last week with regard to this incident with Archer. He said at that point, he said at that stage, that I've heard both sides of the story. So I'm guessing that the content of the WhatsApp audio, uh, you would think, wouldn't have been that much of a surprise. In fact, a lot of it had been alluded to in reports. It's just to hear it laid out in very stark terms maybe brought home to people the extent um, uh, the extent of what happened in the suburb also I guess the, the attitude that the players have to it in the sense that well I don't know you're reading between the lines that this is something that they've sort of seen before yeah, yeah it is, there, we do get that sense from listening to, uh, to Ward speak about it in that uh, WhatsApp here and that you know you kind of get the sense that this is just Roy being Roy mm. But I don't know if Roy yeah. being Roy is one hundred percent okay. Yeah, yeah. Because I wonder. I wonder, and I'd be curious. And Dan's taken this as well. Is there a generational gap there? Because I know it becomes a bit tedious when you hear uh, Brian Clough references so often around this camp. But um, you know, we know how Brian Clough operated, and he would have been no stranger to physically hitting players and the, the language he used. And uh, I, I just I wonder: Do Roy and Martin think? 
that kind of stuff is acceptable and that the modern generation of players don't. But they worked, this is, this is the thing I can never understand about the, the Clough references, they worked under two different Brian Cloughs. Mm. Like the one that Martin O'Neill worked under, as Martin O'Neill will readily tell you, won two European Cups. Yeah. The one that uh, Roy Keane played under was a barely functioning alcoholic. Uh, and I think mm. that's pretty yeah. widely known and it's not exactly the greatest example that any manager could set to a, a young burgeoning pro like Keane would have been at the time no but he would always have uh, he would have always exalted um, Clough like uh, I think part of it might have been due to the fallen out with Ferguson but he always uh, when he was asked his, his the best manager he worked under he would have always put Clough ahead of Ferguson so yeah it's the, the, the one thing is Dan you see we've got two matches in this international break and obviously we need a bit of a pick me up uh, from the Wales disaster the other night we're now barely thinking about football heading into the second match of the week. It's a bizarre situation. Yeah, well, I mean, maybe it suits them because there's, there's no players. <laughs> you know, they're, yeah. they're really light at the moment and uh, they're on a bit of a hiding to nothing <laughs> with this game tomorrow. I think, I mean, you know, in the interest of fairness, I mean, they are seriously weakened with Coleman gone as well. Mm. Yes, you know, let's be realistic. You know, if Ireland have another drubbing tomorrow, there's not going to be a huge amount of sympathy because it just gets tied in with the, the whole... I suppose the the team of of what's gone on over the last week, and yeah, it is interesting to what you're saying to hear your thoughts and their views. And I think Roy Keane doesn't he sort of you know tell the anecdote about getting punched by Brian Clough, and he sort of mm. tells it in a sort of fond terms. And you do get the sense that Roy Keane would quite advocate any strategy whereby punching players was uh, an acceptable way of of coping with it. And yeah, I mean, I think again we're going back to O'Neill. Felt, I mean, he used the words in Cardiff on Thursday uh, that this had been put to bed, you know, this art of had been put to bed. So this coming up now, again, it just couldn't have gone any worse, really, you know, because they were trying to move beyond that. And I think, really, O'Neill had adopted the line that, well, Walters was, was almost man enough, mm. you know, to get beyond this and, and to get over it. And he's here, and, and Harry Arthur is not. Uh, and I felt at that stage that Arthur's international future with O'Neill and Keane was over, but but hmm. maybe now I don't know. Is there more sympathy towards Arthur because of the version of events that has now been circulated and that everyone has heard? If you get it, you know. So yeah. that's that, that's uh, an angle to this. But I mean, this is like throw. It has thrown things into disarray. I know sometimes we get accused of like you know, blowing things out of proportion, but this was going around this morning. Certainly, you know, my understanding of it was that uh, you know the, the the management were aware of this from an early stage and. Uh, you know, contacting the relevant people. So um, this is something that has ruined their trip, effectively, to this point. And they, they had a few hours to get it together. And to be honest, you know, in the circumstances, handled it reasonably well in terms of um, trying to push as much of a brave face on it as you can. But the, the reality of it is such that um, it's been, people now know what the culture is within that group within the camp that people have become accustomed to over a period of time and they now have to decide you know in the, in the, after every bad result now I mean let's park tomorrow but, but in October say this will be referenced this will be well you know what the culture is like you know what the mood is like you know any player carrying a knock or something there will be a sort of an innuendo or a joke or a quip around it and that is the problem that they're in they're, they're this, this is a uh, this couldn't have gone any worse in terms of a double header that was supposed to be about fresh vibes yeah. and you know forgetting the past and, and moving forward. It's, it's the more recent past than the five one to Denmark that's killing us now. Yeah, because I, I think that's bang on, Dan. Because I think there was a concerted effort to bring in you know a former Glasnost or Perestroika over the last few weeks with you know the round of media interviews that Martin O'Neill was being a bit more open. And then I think there was an, uh, an attempt to show, that, to portray a fresh start and that we're, you know, drawing a line in the sand over what happened the last campaign, we're going to kick on. Mm -hmm. Then the Declan Rice thing happened, the Harry Archer stuff happened, and then the hammering by Wales, and now this stuff blowing up as well. And it's put huge pressure on them. And when you look how close the Euro 2020 draw is, and it's in the Convention Centre in Dublin, and the pressure to get a few results now in October is massive. Yeah, it starts at tomorrow yeah, night. Yeah, huge. Dan, we'll let you go and enjoy your local celebrity for the night that's in it. Uh, Dan McDonald of the Irish <laughs> Independent. More from Dan and imagine as the week goes on.